Making America, Chapter 1, Making a New World to 1588. Individual Choices, Lion Sinecock, the Powhatan. Things were bad and getting worse for the people who lived along North America's eastern shore. For generations, they had lived peacefully in their largely self-sufficient villages on the corn that the women grew and the game that the men hunted. Warfare was infrequent and famine all but unknown. But around 600 years ago, a long-lasting change in the weather made corn production less dependable and the people were forced to hunt and gather more wild foods. As hunters from individual villages roamed deeper into the forest looking for food, they encountered others who, like themselves, were desperate to harvest the diminishing resources. Conflicts became common. The Powhatan people decided that collaboration with neighbors for both defense and expansion of resources was the best solution. Oral testimony suggests that in around 1550, six village-based groups whose territories occupied about 25 square miles near what is now Richmond, Virginia, formed an alliance and placed a hereditary chieftain, Werowance, in charge of coordinating their mutual efforts. At about the same time, a child was born in one of those villages who would become a great figure in the Confederation's future. We do not know what his childhood name was, but as an adult, he was called Wahimsunakok, or sometimes just the Powhatan. Throughout Wahimsunakok's life, conditions for the people got continuously worse. In addition to the bad weather, other neighboring groups had also begun to consolidate into local confederacies, and brush fire conflicts were common. But what was more troubling was the increasingly frequent appearance of odd-looking strangers who arrived in ever greater numbers along their shores. Most times, these strangers seemed just to be looking around, exploring the coastline and various river inlets. Other times, they seemed interested in trading often wonderful things for items that the Indians traditionally traded among themselves. But sometimes they took away women and children who were never to be seen again. And even worse, shortly after each time these strangers appeared, people in the villages became sick and a great many died. When Wahan Sinecock reached adulthood, he became the Werowance of the Six Village Confederacy into which he had been born. He decided that, in light of worsening conditions, the limited scope of his little alliance system was not adequate to ensure the continued safety and prosperity of his people. He then made a consequential decision. His political state must either expand or die. Calling upon support from the five to six hundred fighting men who lived in the six villages, Wahan Sinecock launched an effort to restructure the region's political makeup. Over a period of 20 years or so, Wahan Sinecock and his followers used a combination of diplomacy, intermarriage, and brute force to pull other little confederacies and isolated villages into a larger confederation as depicted on Powhatan's mantle, shown in the individual voices feature at the end of this chapter. Eventually, the Six Village Alliance grew to nearly 30 villages that occupied some 8,000 square miles and could field between 1,500 and 2,000 armed soldiers. As remarkable as Wyan Sinecock's story is, his experience was, well, his experience was not entirely unique. Faced with changing conditions, natural ones at first, and then those brought by invading Europeans, Indians throughout the Americas struggled valiantly and creatively to restructure their societies and their lives. Sometimes the effort brought success, but often at the cost of war and great sacrifice. Wahan Sinecock and his contemporary visionaries succeeded in reshaping America, crafting what Europeans naively, but in this one sense quite correctly, called the New World. And in the process, they helped shape the entire Atlantic world, where the making of America would soon take center stage. For nearly a thousand years before the Powhatans formed their confederacy, a combination of natural and human forces truly global in scope was having a profound impact throughout the Atlantic world. For example, in 632, a vibrant new religion swept out of the Arabian Peninsula to conquer much of the Mediterranean world. At the same time, climate changes encouraged expansion by Viking warlords out of Scandinavia southward into the European mainland and westward to Iceland and Greenland. Together, these expansive societies introduced new technologies and knowledge of distant and mysterious worlds that would generate an atmosphere of restlessness throughout Europe. One of those mysterious worlds lay to the south of the forbidding Sahara Desert in Africa. There, as in both America and Europe, people had been dealing with changing conditions by crafting societies and economies that made the most of varying environments. When trading caravans began penetrating this region in the 8th century, they found highly developed cities that could draw on massive populations and natural resources to produce goods that were in great demand throughout the evolving Atlantic world. Like Native Americans, Africans too would be drawn into the restlessness that characterized this dynamic age. A mere 50 or so years before the Powhatans united, Christopher Columbus, a Genoese navigator in Spain's employ, rediscovered the Western Hemisphere while trying to find the hidden and distant worlds known to Islamic traders. Columbus's accident brought two historical streams together, and from that point onward, the history of each helped to form the future of both. On a global scale, this event launched a new era in human history. On a more local scale, it began a process we call Making America. A world of change, considering the questions.
How did environmental changes influence the development of various societies in North America during the millennia before the emergence of the Atlantic world? What forces came into play in the centuries before 1500 that would launch Europeans on a program of outward exploration? And what factors in Sub-Saharan African history helped lead to the development of the slave trade? Christopher Columbus's accidental encounter with the Western Hemisphere came after nearly a thousand years of increasing restlessness and dramatic change that affected all of the areas surrounding the Atlantic Ocean. As Muslims gained a foothold in Southern Europe, word spread of the finery they obtained through trade with Africa and Asia, and enterprising individuals began looking for ways to profit by supplying such luxuries to European consumers. At the same time, Northern European Vikings were extending their holdings throughout many parts of Europe. Then after Columbus, millennia of relative isolation for the Western Hemisphere ended, and the natural and human environments in America were open to the flow of people, animals, goods, and I would also add ideas, already circulating in this dynamic new system. American Origins it might be said that the process of making America actually began about two and a half million years ago with the onset of the Great Ice Ages. During the height of the Ice Ages, gigantic glaciers advanced and withdrew across the world's continents. During periods of glacial advancement, so much water was frozen into the glaciers that sea levels dropped as much as 450 feet. Migratory animals found vast regions closed to them by the imposing ice fields and ventured into areas exposed by the receding sea. One such region, Beringia, lay between present-day Siberia on the Asian continent and Alaska in North America. Now covered by the waters of the Bering Sea and Arctic Ocean, Beringia during the Ice Ages was a dry, frigid grassland. Most recently, between 70,000 and 10,000 years ago, it was a perfect grazing ground for animals such as giant bison and huge tusked woolly mammoths. Hosts of predators, including large wolves and saber-toothed cats, followed them. What was true for other species may also have been true for humans. Each of the indigenous peoples who continue to occupy this hemisphere has its own account of its origins. Some of those origin stories involve migration and others do not. The most recent biological evidence suggests that the majority of Native Americans did migrate here and are descended from three genetic lines. The first of these lines, so-called Paleo-Indians, probably made the migration more than 30,000 years ago and their population spread throughout North and South America. Then, for a period stretching to about 16,000 years ago, a sheet of ice more than 8,000 feet thick covered the northern half of North America and prevented further migration. After that, a second migration of what are called the Nadene people began arriving, to be followed 10,000 or so years later by a third group, the Eskimo Aleut people. DNA evidence indicates that these three groups intermingled, creating the variety of Indians the Europeans encountered when they arrived many millennia later. Beginning about 9,000 years ago, temperatures warmed, leading to the extinction of the large Ice Age animals. As these staple meat sources disappeared, people everywhere in North America abandoned big game hunting and began to explore newly emerging local environments for new sources of food, clothing, shelter, and tools. In the forests that grew up to cover the eastern half of the continent, they developed finely polished stone tools, which they used to make functional and beautiful implements out of wood, bone, shell, and other materials. There and along the Pacific shore, people hollowed out massive tree trunks, making boats from which they could harvest food from inland waterways and from the sea. During this time, incoming migrants brought domesticated dogs into North America. With boats for river transportation and dogs to help carry loads on land, Native American people were able to make the best use of their local environments by moving around to different spots during different seasons of the year, following an annual round of movement from camp to camp, perhaps collecting shellfish for several weeks at the mouth of a river, then moving to where wild strawberries were ripening, and later in the summer, relocating to fields where they could harvest maturing wild onions or sunflower seeds. Although these ancestors of modern Native Americans believed in and celebrated the animating spirits of the plants and animals they depended on for survival, they nonetheless engaged in large-scale environmental engineering. They used fire to clear forests of unwanted scrub and to encourage the growth of berries and other plants they found valuable. In this way, they produced vegetables for themselves and also provided food for browsing animals such as deer, which also increased in number while other species, less useful to people, declined. They also engaged in genetic engineering. A highly significant example of this genetic engineering comes from North Central Mexico where, beginning perhaps several thousand years ago, human intervention helped a wild strain of grass develop bigger seed pods with more nutritious seeds. Such intervention eventually transformed a fairly unproductive plant into an enormously nourishing and prolific food crop, maize, also known as corn. Maize, corn, and by the way, I think there is a distinction and there's a certain reason why you use one term or the other, and I'm not entirely sure what that is, but I think that there is a distinction. So those of you who are more into, um, you know, botany and plants and things like that, maybe you could share with us what that difference is. 
But anyways, maize, or corn, along with other engineered plants like beans, squash, and chilies, formed the basis for an agricultural revolution in North America, allowing many people to settle in larger villages for longer periods. Successful adaptation, including plant cultivation and eventually agriculture, along with population growth and the constructive use of spare time, allowed some Indians in North America to build large, ornate cities. The map of ancient America is dotted with such centers. Beginning about 3,000 years ago, the Ohio and Mississippi Valleys became the home for a number of mound builder societies whose cities became trading and ceremonial centers that had enormous economic and social outreach. And they're called mound builders because they build big mounds out of earth for ceremonial and religious purposes. Large quantities of both practical and purely decorative artifacts from all over North America have been found at these sites. Then, about 800 years ago, Midwestern mound builder sites fell into decline and the people who once had congregated there withdrew to separated villages or bands. No single satisfactory explanation accounts for exactly why this happened. We're going to go up to the top of the page now to read It Matters Today, Native Americans Shape a New World. It may be hard to imagine why understanding the original peopling of North America and how Native cultures evolved during the millennia before Columbus could possibly matter to the history of the United States or more specifically to how we live our lives today. But with it, without this chapter in our history, there likely would have been no U.S. history at all. Europeans in the 15th century lacked the tools, the organization, the discipline, and the economic resources to conquer a true wilderness. Such a feat would have been the equivalent of our establishing a successful colony on Mars today. But the environmental and genetic engineering conducted through the millennia of North American history created a hospitable environment into which European crops, animals, and people could easily transplant themselves. And while the descendants of those Europeans may often suppose that they constructed an entirely new world in North America, the fact is that they simply grafted new growth onto ancient rootstock, creating the unique hybrid that is today's America. What that's saying basically is that Native Americans sort of had prepared North America prior to European contact, that they'd sort of, you know, set the scene before Europeans came in and brought their new things. If you'd like, you can consider, consider these questions. As an exercise in counterfactual history, describe what life would have been like for European colonists in the New World if no Indians had been present. For example, what if Columbus had found no gold or French fishermen had found no one to trade with? What if there had been no tobacco or corn for colonists to grow and market? Or in what ways are the Indian heritages of America still visible in our society today? Change and Restlessness in the Atlantic World During the few centuries following the death of the Prophet Muhammad in 632, Muslim Arabs, Turks, and Moors made major inroads into Western Asia and Northern Africa, eventually encroaching on Europeans, Europe's southern and eastern frontiers. During the same years, Scandinavian Vikings, who controlled the northern frontiers of Europe, began expanding southward. They also began colonizing Iceland and Greenland. Over the decades that followed, Vikings established several outposts on the North American coast from present-day Maine to Newfoundland. By about the year 1000, then, the heartland of Europe was surrounded by dynamic societies that introduced Europeans to a much broader world. Although Europeans resented and resisted both Viking and Islamic invasion, the newcomers brought with them tempting new technologies, food items, and expansive knowledge. These contributions not only enriched European culture, but also improved the quality of life. For example, new farming methods increased food production so much that Europe began to experience a population explosion. That's a really big consequence of outward expansion and contact with other societies. Europe begins to have this huge population boom because now they have a much more varied diet. They're eating a lot more different crops, getting you know a lot healthier, basically. Soon Europeans would begin turning this new knowledge and those new tools against the people who brought them. Iberians launched a Reconquista, an effort to break Islamic rule on the peninsula. Portugal attained independence in 1147, and by 1380, Portugal's King John I had united that country's various principalities under his rule. In Spain, unification took much longer, but in 6 1469, excuse me, Ferdinand and Isabella, heirs to the rival thrones of Aragon and Castile, married and created a united Spain. 23 years later, in 1492, the Spanish subdued the last Moorish stronghold on the peninsula, completing the Reconquista, and you probably know 1492 for another reason, I'm guessing. Dealing with the Vikings in the north took a somewhat different turn. Although experts disagree about the exact timing, it appears that at some time between 1350 and 1450, a significant climatic shift called the Little Ice Age began to affect the entire world. In the Arctic and Subarctic, temperatures fell, snowfall increased, and sea ice became a major hazard to navigation. This shift made it impossible for the Vikings to practice the herding, farming, and trading that supported their economy in the North Atlantic. Finding themselves cut off from a vibrant North Atlantic empire 
Viking settlements in the British Isles, Russia, France, and elsewhere merged with local populations. Like Native Americans at the same time, these Viking refugees often joined with their neighbors in recognizing the value of large-scale political organization. Consolidation began in France around 1480, when Louis XI took control of five rival provinces to create a unified kingdom. Five years later in England, Henry Tudor and the House of Lancaster defeated the rival House of York, ending nearly a hundred years of civil war. Tudor, now styling himself King Henry VII, cemented this victory by marrying into the rival house, wedding Elizabeth of York to finally unify the English throne. As in Spain and Portugal, the, forma the formation of unified states in France and England opened the way to new expansion activities that would accelerate the creation of the Atlantic world. We're going to skip up now to in the wider world, Polynesians populate the Pacific. At the same time that Native American populations were settling into their new environments, another great migration was taking place on the opposite side of the world. Some 6,000 years ago, from a starting point somewhere near the modern island, my, modern island nation of Taiwan, people in sail-rigged canoes began taking well-planned voyages toward the Philippine Islands. Setting up residence there, they continued to island hop until around 1200 BCE, by which time they had established populations in a chain all the way up to the Solomon Islands east of New Guinea. From there, they continued moving eastward, setting up residence in Fiji, Samoa, and Tonga. During the next thousand years, such voyages continued until these Polynesian people occupied, in the words of Jared Diamond, every habitable scrap of land in the vast watery triangle of ocean whose apexes are Hawaii, New Zealand, and Easter Island. And while there is little physical evidence of their voyaging to the west coast of the Americas, and by little physical evidence, I think that they actually mean none, um, it was certainly within their technical and navigational abilities, and some speculate that they may well have, but that theory is not a very popular one, just to insert my own personal view there. The Complex World of Indian America The world into which Vikings first sailed at the beginning of the second millennium, and into which other Europeans would intrude half a millennium later, was not the same static realm stuck in the Stone Age. Native American societies were every bit as progressive, adaptable, and historically dynamic as those that would invade their homes. Basically, Native Americans are not a monolith. They go through evolution and change just like every other culture everywhere else does. In fact, adaptive flexibility characterized Indian life throughout North America. Scholars have tried to make the extremely complicated cultural map of North America understandable by dividing the continent into a series of cultural areas, regions where the similarities among Native societies were greater than the differences. In the southeastern region of North America, peoples speaking Siouan, Catawan, and Muscogean languages formed vibrant agricultural and urban societies, with ties to exchange centers further north as well as to traders from Mexico. At places like Natchez, fortified cities housed gigantic pyramids, and farmland radiating outward provided food for large residential populations. These were true cities, and like their counterparts in Europe and Asia, they were magnets that attracted ideas, technologies, and religious notions from the entire continent. Farther north, in the region called the Eastern Woodlands, people lived in smaller villages and combined agriculture with hunting and gathering. The Iroquois, for example, and you're going to hear a lot about the Iroquois in this course, lived in towns out, um, numbering 3,000 or more people, changing locations only as soil fertility, firewood, and game became exhausted. Each town was made up of a group of longhouses, structures that were often 60 feet or more in length. A tradition that may go back to the time when the Iroquois lived as nomadic hunters and gatherers dictated that men and women occupy different spheres of existence. The women's world was the world of plants, healing, nurturing, and order. The men's was the world of animals, hunting, and war. By the late pre-Columbian times, the Iroquois had become strongly agricultural, and because plants were in the women's sphere, women occupied places of high social and economic status in Iroquois society, ruling over domestic politics. Families were matrilineal, matrilineal, meaning that they traced their descent through the mother's line, and matrilocal, meaning that a man left his home to move in with his wife's family upon marriage. Women distributed the rights to cultivate specific fields, and women controlled the harvest. Matrilineality is an important idea to understand. Again, that is more when society is centered around the woman, the woman's identity, the woman's family, and that's usually opposed to patrilineality, which is where identity and society is structured around the man's identity and the man's family and the man's life. Variations on the Iroquois economic and social pattern were typical throughout the Eastern Woodlands and in the neighboring Great Plains and Southwest. Having strong ties with agriculturalists in the east, plains groups such as the Mandans began settling on bluffs overlooking the many streams that eventually drain into the Missouri River. Living in substantial houses insulated against the cold winters, these people divided their time among hunting, crop raising, and trade. By 1300, such villages could be found along every stream ranging southward from North Dakota into present-day Kansas. <laughs> 
In the southwest, groups with strong ties to Mexico began growing corn as early as 3,200 years ago, but they continued to follow a migratory life until about 400 CE, when they began to build larger and more substantial houses and limiting their migrations. The greatest change, however, came during the 8th century, when a shift in climate made the region drier and a pattern of late summer thunderstorms triggered dangerous and erosive flash floods. We're going to skip back real fast to that deeper understanding of history. It's the weather, stupid, climate and culture on page 9. History is often written as though it happens in a vacuum, ignoring that our species, like all others, lives in a dyna dynamic physical environment. The earth under our feet changes geology, the water that supports all life changes hydrology, and vast changes in climate also affect us climatology. And these changes all interact in complicated ways. History in part must study how we've responded to this physical world in our constant quest to survive. The graph below shows the average of various reconstructions of global average temperatures between 1000 and 1800. Noting that the zero line on this graph represents the normal modern temperature, it's apparent that during the time period covered by this and several of the chapters that follow, things were a lot colder than usual. There's no consensus among climatologists as to why this happened. Different theories suggest orbital cycles, decreased solar activity, increased volcanic activity, and altered ocean current flows, or some combination of these factors. Some even think that inadvertent human contributions may have been responsible for the changes that population declines due to medieval plagues may have led to increased forestation, which in turn decreased carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. This 400-year cooling trend had different impacts on different societies. Hunting and gathering societies, like many in North America, found that they had to expand their territories to compensate for diminished resources. Agricultural societies often found that usually reliable crops could no longer sustain local populations. In both the Old and New Worlds, there was a tendency to create larger and more complicated political organizations to even out the ill effects. Interest grew in new technologies that might help people compensate for the changes they were experiencing. Europeans expanded trading networks into the Middle East and Asia. From there, they borrowed navigational tools that permitted them to expand even more, finally all the way to North America. There, Native Americans borrowed European technologies to enhance survival. And side by side with these trends, conflict, war, and subjugation of populations increased as self-interested societies sought to improve their own conditions irrespective of the impact on others. It is easy then to look back at this period in human history and point fingers at the nearly constant violence and selfishness that seemed to characterize it, but taking a rapid, radical, and sustained change of climate into consideration forces us to reassess and perhaps temper our judgments. It also forces us to think a little more broadly about what causes history to happen the way that it does. Going back to page 11 now, there seem to have been two quite different responses to this change in climate. A group called the Anasazi expanded their agricultural ways, cooperating to build flood control dams and irrigation canals. We're here in like the southwestern part of the United States, by the way. The need, modern day United States. The need for cooperative labor meant forming larger communities, and between about 900 and 1300, the Anasazi built whole cities of multi story apartment houses along the high cliffs, safe from flooding but near their irrigated fields. In these densely populated towns, Anasazi craft specialists manufactured goods such as pots, textiles, and baskets for the community, while farmers tended fields and priests attended to the spiritual needs of the society. Apush loves to ask about differences and similarities in Native American societies over time, understanding that in particular that cliff building, cliff dwellings, and also irrigation canals are a really big thing in the Southwest. I expect that to be on a quiz or an exam at some point in time. Another contingent of southwestern Indians abandoned the region, moving southward into Mexico. One of these groups, the Aztecs, arrived in the Valley of Mexico soon after 1200, settling on a small island in the middle of a brackish lake. From this unappealing center, a series of strong leaders used a combination of diplomacy and brutal warfare to establish a tributary empire that eventually ruled as many as six million people. Other major changes occurred in the southwest after 1300. During the last quarter of the 13th century, a long string of summer droughts and bitterly cold winters forced the Anasazi to abandon their cities. They disappeared as a people, splitting into smaller communities that eventually became the various Pueblo groups. At the same time, an entirely new population entered the region. These hunter-gatherers brought new technologies, including the bow and arrow, into the southwest. About half of them continued to be hunter-gatherers, while the rest borrowed cultivating and home-building techniques from the Pueblos. Europeans who later entered this area called the hunter-gatherers Apaches and the settled agriculturalists Navajos. In other regions, agriculture is practiced only marginally, if at all. In areas like the Great Basin, desert conditions made agriculture too risky, and in California, the Northwest Coast, and the Intermountain Plateau, 
the bounty of available wild foods made it unnecessary. In these regions, hunting and gathering remained the chief occupations. For example, the Nez Perce and their neighbors living in the Plateau region occupied permanent village sites in the winter but did not stay together in a single group all year. Rather, they would form task groups, which were temporary villages that came together to share the labor required to harvest a particular resource, and then they went their separate ways. These task groups brought together not only people who lived in different winter villages, but often people from different tribes and even different language groups. In such groups, political authority passed among those who were best qualified to supervise particular activities. If the task group was hunting, the best and most senior hunters, almost always men, exercised political authority. But if the task group was gathering roots, then the best and most senior diggers, almost always women, ruled. Thus, among such hunting-gathering people, political organization changed from season to season, and social status depended on what activities were most important to the group at a particular time. As these examples illustrate, variations in daily life and social arrangements in pre-Columbian North America reflected variations in climate, soil conditions, food supplies, and cultural heritages from place to place across the vast continent. But despite the enormous size of the continent and the amazing variety of cultures spread across it, economic and social connections within, this and, be within and between ecological regions tied the people together in complex ways. For example, varieties of shell found only along the northwestern Pacific coast were traded to settlements as far away as Florida, having been passed from hand to hand over thousands of miles of social and physical space. And that's another thing that Apush loves to make sure that you understand that there are these vast trading networks that bring goods and people and ideas and things across gigantic spaces, across these huge spaces. Um, it, a lot of students find that surprising that you know, we find shells from the coast as far inland as Kansas. That just goes to show you how sophisticated Native American societies really were. A world of change in Africa. Like North America, Africa was home to an array of societies that developed in response to varying natural and historical conditions. But unlike contemporary Indian groups, Africans maintained continual, if perhaps only sporadic, contact, contacts with societies in Europe and Asia. In ancient times, tendrils of trade tied the Mediterranean and Sub-Saharan Africa together, but during the past 5,000 years, increasing desertification cut off most of Africa from the fertile areas of the Mediterranean coast. Desertification, by the way, is going to refer there to the spread of the Saharan desert. The people living south of the desert were forced to largely reinvent civilization in response to changing conditions. They abandoned the wheat and other grain crops that had dominated in earlier economies, domesticating new staples such as millet. They also abandoned the cattle and horses that had been common in earlier times, adopting sheep and goats, which were better suited to arid or dry environments. Depending on immediate conditions, groups could establish large villages and live on a balance of vegetables, meat, and milk, or, if necessary, shift over to a purely nomadic lifestyle following their herds. Social organization tended to follow a similar adaptive strategy. The most common social structure was based on the belief that large geographically and linguistically related groups were descended from a common fictive ancestor. These larger organizations were then subdivided into smaller and smaller groups, each independent, as a modern nuclear family might be, but tied through an elaborate family tree to hundreds or even thousands of other similar groups. The status of each group was determined by seniority in the line of descent. Those descended from the oldest offspring of the common ancestor were socially and politically superior to those descended from younger branches. This fundamental hierarchy created an organizational structure that permitted large group cooperation and management when appropriate, but also permitted each small band to function independently when conditions required. Within each group, seniority also determined political and social status. The eldest descendant of the common ancestor within each group held superior power. Like many Native American societies, traditional African groups practiced various forms of bonded labor. Most often, slaves in these societies were war captives, debtors, or criminals, and they frequently were treated like junior members of the fictive family into which they were adopted. It was not unheard of for such subordinates to earn their freedom or even to attain positions of honor and leadership. And slavery in these societies also is often not hereditary, meaning that just because your mother or father was a slave doesn't automatically mean that you're going to be enslaved as well. Sometime between two and 3,000 years ago, sub-Saharan groups appear to have discovered iron smelting. Craftsmen were able to make use of abundant raw iron deposits in southern Africa to produce tools, vessels, and weapons. Often, large cities with elaborate social hierarchies grew in neighborhoods where iron and other ores were particularly abundant. These would then become centers for trade as well as political hubs, the seeds from which later kingdoms and empires would sprout. These trading centers became particularly important when Islamic expansion brought new outside sources for trade into the sub-Saharan world. The first mention of trade between Islamic adventurers and African communities stems from the 8th century, and it seems to have developed slowly over the next several hundred years. 
Increasingly, after 1100, iron, gold, precious gems, and slaves were carried across the desert by Muslim traders, who gave African middlemen silks, spices, and other foreign goods in exchange. This trade tended to enhance the power of African elites, leading to ever larger and more elaborate states. Exploiting Atlantic Opportunities Considering the questions, how did the Atlantic world change as a result of efforts to exploit new discoveries leading up to and following 1492? And how did Native Americans and Africans respond initially to European expansion? Dynamic forces in America, Europe, Africa, and beyond were drawing the disparate societies that occupied the Atlantic shore into a complex world of mutual experience. Generally seeking profits for themselves and advancement for their own nations, tribes, or classes, those who sought to exploit the emerging new world nonetheless had an enormous impact on the lives of all who occupied it. The process of outreach and historical evolution that helped launch the American experience grew directly from these efforts at exploitation. The Portuguese, Africa, and plantation slavery. The first of the European states to pull itself together was also the first to challenge Islamic dominance in the both the Asian and African trade. Portugal's John I encouraged exploration by establishing a school of navigation on his kingdom's southwestern shore. The school sent numerous expeditions in search of new sources of wealth. By the 1430s, the Portuguese had discovered and taken control of islands off the western shore of Africa, and within 30 years had pushed their way to Africa itself, opening relations with various states. For centuries, traders in these states had shipped valuable trade goods across the Sahara by means of caravans. The Portuguese, however, offered speedier shipment and higher profits by carrying goods, trade goods directly to Europe by sea. By the end of the 15th century, Portuguese navigators had gained control over the flow of prized items such as gold, ivory, and spices out of West Africa, and Portuguese colonizers were growing sugar and other crops on the newly conquered Azores and Canary Islands. Increasing contact with African societies led to growing awareness among Europeans of the traditional forms of slavery practiced by these groups. As early as the 14th century, African slaves began to be seen in southern Europe, but they remained largely a novelty. From the beginning of the 16th century onward, however, the Portuguese became increasingly involved in slave tra trafficking as the demand for labor on their Atlantic plantation islands increased. Having no sense of kinship, even fictive kinship, with Africans led to much harsher conditions for slaves under European ownership, though there is no indication that those African merchants who sold their slaves to the Portuguese understood the horrors these men and women would experience. And as plantations expanded throughout the Americas, the demand for labor led to an ever-increasing traffic in such unfortunates, which in their ignorance or indifference, African merchants were more than willing to provide. By 1550, Portuguese ships were carrying African slaves throughout the world. The Continued Quest for Asian Trade Meanwhile, the Portuguese continued to venture onward. In 1487, Bartolomeu Diaz, let's just call him Diaz, became the first European to reach the Cape of Good Hope at the southern tip of Africa. Ten years later, Vasco da Gama sailed around the Cape and launched the Portuguese exploration of eastern Africa and the Indian Ocean. Because of its early head start, Portugal remained fairly cautious in its explorations, hugging the coast around Africa before crossing the ocean to India. As latecomers, other European nations could not afford to take such a conservative approach to exploration. Voyagers from those countries took advantage of borrowed technologies to expand their horizons. From China, Europeans acquired the magnetic compass, which allowed mariners to determine direction even when out of sight of land. An Arab invention, the astrolabe, allowed seafarers to calculate the positions of heavenly bodies and determine their latitude or their distance north or south of the equator. These inventions, together with improvements in steering mechanisms and hull designs, made voyages much less risky. A number of visionary navigators longed for the opportunity to seek new routes. One, an ambitious sailor from the Italian port city of Genoa, Christopher Columbus, approached several European governments to support a voyage westward from Europe across the Atlantic to the East Indies, but he found nobody willing to fund him. Finally, in 1492, there's that year again, Ferdinand and Isabella's defeat of the Moors provided Columbus with an opportunity. Eager to break into overseas trading, dominated in, the, dominated in the east by the Arabs and the south and west by the Portuguese, Ferdinand and Isabella agreed to equip three ships in exchange for a short, safe route to the Orient. On August 3, 1492, Columbus and some 90 sailors departed on the Niña, the Pinta, and the Santa Maria for the uncharted waters of the Atlantic. More than three months later, they finally made landfall. Columbus thought he'd arrived in the East Indies, but in fact he had reached the islands that we now call the Bahamas. Over the next 10 weeks, Columbus explored the mysteries of the Caribbean, making landfalls on the islands now known as Cuba and Hispaniola. He collected spices, coconuts, bits of gold, and some native captives. 
Columbus then returned to Spain, where he was welcomed with great celebration and rewarded with backing for three more voyages. Over the next several years, the Spanish gained a permanent foothold in the region that Columbus had discovered and became aware that the area was a world entirely new to them. England, like Spain, was jealous of Portugal's trade monopoly, and in 1497, Henry VII commissioned another Italian mariner, Giovanni Caboto, to search for a sea route to India. John Cabot, as the English called him, succeeded in crossing the North Atlantic. Shortly thereafter, another Italian, Amerigo Vespucci, sailing under the Spanish flag, sighted the northeastern shore of South America and sailed northward into the Caribbean in search of a passage to the east. Finally, in 1524, Giovanni de Verrazzano, sailing for France, explored the Atlantic coast of North America, quite possibly becoming the first of the strangers to visit Wahunsinacoc's land. A New Transatlantic World At first, European monarchs greeted the diversity of a new world as bad news. They wanted access to the riches of Asia, not contact with some undiscovered place. As knowledge of the new world spread, the primary goal of exploration became finding a route around it or through it. But even before Verrazano, ambitious adventurers from Western Europe began exploring the fertile fishing grounds off the northern shores of North America. By 1506, such voyages became so common that the King of Portugal placed a 10% tax on fish imported from North America. But these voyages did more than feed the European imagination and the continent's appetite for seafood. Europeans, even relatively poor fishermen, had many things that the Indians lacked. They had copper pots, jewelry, woolen blankets, and hundreds of other novelties. For their part, the Indians provided firewood, food, ivory, and furs. Apparently, the trade grew quickly. By 1534, when Jacques Cartier made the first official exploration of the Canadian coast for the French government, he was approached by party after party of Indians offering to trade furs for the goods he carried. He could only conclude that many other Europeans had come before him. The presence of explorers such as Verrazano and Cartier and of unknown numbers of anonymous fishermen and part-time traders had several effects on the native population. The Mi'kmaqs, Hurons, and other northeastern Indian groups approached the invading Europeans in friendship, eager to trade and to learn more about the strangers. In part, this response was a sign of natural curiosity, but it also reflects some serious changes taking place in the native world of North America. As we've noted, the onset of the Little Ice Age had far-reaching effects. The deteriorating climate made it far more difficult for groups like Wahoon Sinecock's villages to depend on their own corn crops for food. Forced to rely more on hunting and gathering, they had to expand their territory, and in doing so, they came into conflict with their neighbors. As warfare became more common, groups increasingly formed alliances for mutual defense, systems like the Powhatan Confederacy. And Indians often found it beneficial to welcome European newcomers into their midst as trading partners bearing new tools, as allies in the evolving conflicts with neighboring Indian groups, and as powerful magicians whose shamans might provide explanations and remedies for the hard times that had befallen them. The Challenges of Mutual Discovery Considering the questions, how did Native Americans and Europeans respond to increasing contact with each other, and what global changes occurred through the process called the Columbian Exchange? Pay particular attention to the Columbian Exchange, Apush loves to make sure that you know exactly what that is. Europeans approached the New World with certain ideas in mind and defined what they found there in terms that reflected what they already believed. American Indians approached Europeans in the same way. Both of these groups, as well as Africans, were thrown into a new world of understanding that challenged many of their fundamental assumptions. They also exchanged material goods that affected their physical well-being profoundly. A meeting of minds in America. Most Europeans had a firm sense of how the world was arranged, who occupied it, and how they'd come to be where they were. The existence of America, and even more the presence there of American Indians, challenged that secure knowledge. In the first stages of mutual discovery in America, most Europeans were content mentally to reshape what they found in the New World to fit with what they expected to find. Columbus expected to find India and Indians, and he believed that was precisely what he'd found. Other Europeans understood that America was a new land to them and that the Indians were a new people, but they attempted to fit both into the cosmic map outlined in the Bible. In some ways, Europeans may have been easier to Amer for American Indians to understand than the existence of American Indians was for Europeans. To Indians, the world was alive, animated by a spiritual force that was both universal and intelligent. This force took on many forms. Some of these forms were visible in the everyday world of experience, some were visible only at special times, and some were never visible. Social ties based on fictive kinship and reciprocal trade linked all creatures, human and non-human, together into a common cosmos. These connections were chronicled in myth, maintained through ritual, ritual, and graphically recorded in forms like the Powhatan Mantle at the end of this chapter. On this artifact, allied villages are going to be depicted as beaded discs, and their size and distance from the center were determined not by their physical size or distance, but by their social and or spiritual closeness and significance.
Indians formed to maintain these ties by exchanging ceremonial items believed to have spiritual value. In the pre-Columbian trading world, such prized goods passed from society to society, establishing a spiritual bond between the, the initial givers and the eventual receivers, even though the two groups might never meet. Europeans and European goods slipped easily into this ceremonial trading system. The trade items that the Europeans generally offered to American Indians on first contact, glass beads, mirrors, brass bells, resembled closely the items that the Indians traditionally used to establish friendly spiritual and economic relations with strangers. The perceived similarity of the trade goods offered by the Europeans led Indians to accept these newcomers as simply another group in the complex social cosmos uniting the spiritual and material worlds. What that's basically saying is that when Native Americans met Europeans, they weren't super surprised and Europeans appeared to fit into the worldview and the systems that Indians already had in place. On the other hand, Europeans perceived such items as worthless trinkets, validating instead Indian furs and Indian land. This difference in perception became a major source of misunderstanding and conflict. To the Indians, neither the furs nor the land was of much value because by their understanding, they did not own either. According to Native American beliefs, all things had innate spirits and belonged to themselves. Thus, passing animal pelts along to Europeans was simply extending the social connection that had brought the furs into Indian hands in the first place. Similarly, according to Indian belief, land was seen as a living being, a mother who feeds, clothes, and houses people as long as she receives proper respect. The idea of buying or selling land was therefore unthinkable. When Europeans offered spiritually significant objects in exchange for land on which to build, farm, or hunt, Indians perceived the offer as an effort to join an already existing relationship and not as a commercial transaction. They didn't see it as business, in, in other words. The Colombian Exchange Even though Europeans and American Indians saw some similarities in each other, their worlds differed greatly, sometimes in ways hidden to both groups. The natural environments of these worlds were different, and the passage of people, plants, and animals among Europe, Africa, and North America wrought profound changes in all three continents. Historians call this process the Columbian Exchange. The introduction of plants into the New World extended a process that had been taking place for centuries in the Old World. Trade with Asia had carried exotic plants such as bananas, sugarcane, and rice into Africa as early as 2300 years ago. From Africa, these plants were imported to Iberian-claimed islands like the Canaries and eventually to America, where, along with cotton, indigo, coffee, and other imports, they would become cash crops on European-controlled plantations. From both Africa and Europe, grains such as wheat, barley, and millet were readily transplanted to some areas in North America, as were grazing grasses and various vegetables including turnips, spinach, and cabbage. North American plants also traveled from west to east in the Columbian Exchange. Leading the way in economic importance was tobacco, a stimulant used widely in North America for ceremonial purposes and broadly adopted by Europeans and Africans as a recreational drug. In addition, New World vegetables helped to revolutionize world food supplies. Remarkably easy to grow, maize thrived virtually everywhere. In addition, the white-flushed potato, tomato, manioc, squash, and beans native to the Western Hemisphere were soon cultivated throughout the world. Animals also moved in the Columbian Exchange. Europeans brought horses, pigs, cattle, oxen, sheep, goats, and domesticated fowl to America, where their numbers soared. The transplanting of European grain crops and domesticated animals reshaped the American landscape. The contours of the land were changed by clearing trees and undergrowth and by plowing and fencing, which altered the flow of water, the distribution of seeds, the nesting of birds, and the movement of native animals. Gradually, imported livestock pushed aside native species, and imported plants choked out indigenous ones. Perhaps the most tragic trade among the three continents came about as the direct and unavoidable consequence of human contact. During the period leading up to the Age of Exploration, many Europeans lost their lives to epidemic diseases. The Black Death of the 14th century, for example, wiped out more than a third of, Europeans popu of Europe's population. Exposure to smallpox, measles, typhus, and other serious diseases often had devastating results, but Europeans gradually developed resistance to infection. In contrast, the Indian peoples encountered by Columbus and other European explorers lived in an environment in which contagious diseases were never a serious threat until the Europeans arrived. They had no acquired immunity to the various bacteria and viruses the Europeans carried. As a result, the new diseases spread very rapidly and were much more deadly among the native peoples than they were among Europeans. Controversy rages over the number of Indians killed by imported European diseases. Estimates of how many people lived in America north of Mexico in 1492 run from a high of 25 million to a low of 1 million. At the moment, most scholars accept a range from about 3 to 10 million. 
But even if the most conservative estimate is correct, the raw numbers of people who died of imported diseases was enormous. Between 90 and 95% of the native population appears to have died of disease during the first century of contact, making disease probably the most significant part of the Columbian exchange. Although the percentage was probably lower in areas where contact was infrequent and where native populations were sparse, disease took a terrible toll as it followed the lines of kinship and trade that held native North America together. Although exchange diseases killed many millions of Indians and lesser numbers of Africans and Europeans, the transplantation of North American plants significantly expanded food production in what had been marginal areas of Europe and Africa. At the same time, the environmental changes the Europeans wrought along the Atlantic shore of North America permitted the region to support many more people than it had sustained under Indian cultivation. The overall result in Europe and Africa was a population explosion that eventually spilled over to repopulate a devastated North America. New Worlds in Africa and America as the Columbian Exchange redistributed plants, animals, and populations among Europe, Africa, and North America, it permanently altered the history of both hemispheres. In North America, for example, the combination of disease, environmental transformation, and immigrant population pressure changed American Indian life and culture in profound ways. Clearly, imported disease had the most ruinous influence on the lives of Indians. Cooperative labor was, labor was required for hunting and gathering, and native groups faced extinction if disease caused a shortage of labor. Also, most societies in North America were non-literate, meaning that they didn't have a system of reading and writing, rather they practiced oral storytelling um, and, and, you know, verbal things. Um, and wholesale death by disease wiped out the elders and storytellers who preserved practical, religious, and cultural knowledge, resulting in confusion and disorientation among survivors. In an effort to avert extinction, remnant groups banded together to share labor and lore. Members of formerly self-sustaining kinship groups joined together in composite villages or, in some cases, inter-tribal leagues or confederacies. And the devastation that European diseases wrought eased the way for the deeper penetration of Europe's, Europeans into North America as Indians sought alliances with the newcomers to gain new tools, new sources of information, and new military partners, pushing themselves into increasingly tangled relationships with Europeans. The Columbian Exchange also severely disrupted life in Africa. Africa had supplied labor in the Old World. Perhaps as many as 4 million slaves were carried across the desert by Muslim traders between 800 and the time the Portuguese redirected the trade in the 16th century. From that time forward, European technology, wealth, and ideas fostered the development of aggressive centralized states along the slave coast on the shore of West Africa's Gulf of Guinea. I'm going to skip up real fast before we turn the page to read the caption underneath that photo. This audiobook does not typically read captions under photos, but when they're very significant, I do like to try to include them. Although slavery began as a benign practice in traditional African societies, an extension of the hierarchical fictive kin system, at the height of the Atlantic slave trade in the 16th through 18th centuries, it had devolved into a highly malignant enterprise. As depicted here, slave drivers were heavily influenced by outside contact. One of those shown here is wearing an Arab-influenced turban, while the clothing of the others is more European. Note, too, that the latter carries both a gun and a traditional African spear. Back to the reading. Armed with European firearms, aggressive tribes engaged in large-scale raiding deep into the Niger and Congo River regions. These raiders captured millions of prisoners, whom they herded back to the coast and sold to the Portuguese, Spanish, Dutch, and other European traders to supply labor for mines and plantations in the New World. The most recent estimates suggest that more than 9.5 million enslaved Africans arrived in the New World between 1500 and 1800, and they were only a small portion of the total number of Africans victimized by the system. On average, between 10 and 20% of the slaves that shipped to the Americas died in transit. Adding to the numbers who were shipped to other locations in the Eastern Hemisphere, who were kept in slavery within Africa and who died during the raids and on the marches to the coast, yields a staggering total. The discovery of America and the Columbian Exchange also had staggering reper repercussions on life in Europe. New economic opportunities and new ideas demand new kinds of political and economic organization. The discovery of the New World clearly forced a new and more modern society onto Europeans. Europe's population was already rising when potatoes, maize, and other New World crops began to revolutionize food production. Populations then began to soar despite nearly continuous wars and a flood of migration to the New World. European rulers and their advisors saw that centralized states offer the most promising device for harnessing the riches of the New World while controlling ever-increasing numbers of people at home. The sons and daughters of Europe's first generation of absolute monarchs chose to continue the consolidation of authority begun by their parents. 
As Europeans responded to social, political, and economic changes, traditional patterns of authority broke down, especially in the realm of religion. A generation of theologians who were dissatisfied with the perceived corruption and superstition they found in the medieval Catholic Church launched the period known as the Reformation. Known as Protestantism, the doctrines adopted by these reformers launched an ideology that appealed to a broad audience in the rapidly changing European world of the 16th century. Ever critical of entrenched authority, the new doctrines attracted lawyers, bureaucrats, merchants, and manufacturers, whose economic and political status was on the rise thanks to increased prosperity generated by the Columbian Exchange. But many in the ruling classes also found aspects of the new theology attractive. Henry VIII of England, at one time a critic of Protestant ideas, found Protestantism convenient when he wanted to resist the authority of the Pope and expand English national power, and also get a divorce. Henry VIII, the son of Henry VII and Elizabeth of York, was the first undisputed heir to the English throne in several generations, and he was consumed with the desire to avoid renewed civil war. When his wife, Catherine of Aragon, failed to bear a son who might inherit the throne, Henry demanded in 1527 that Pope Clement VII grant him an annulment and permission to marry someone else. Clement refused, and in desperation, Henry seized control of the church in England. While the idea of unifying religious and civil authority under his personal control was appealing, Henry needed Protestant support in his war against the Pope's authority, so he reluctantly opened the door to Protestant practices in his newly created Church of England. After Henry's death, his very young son ascended the throne as Edward VI. In the absence of a strong king, Protestants had virtual free reign, and the pace of reform quickened. Edward, however, died after ruling for only six years, and Mary, his oldest sister, succeeded him. Married to Philip II of Spain and a devout Roman Catholic, Mary attempted to reverse the reforming trend, but her brutality only drove the movement underground and made it more militant. By the time her half-sister Elizabeth, who was born and raised a Protestant, inherited the crown in 1558, the Protestant underground had become powerful and highly motivated. In fact, Elizabeth I spent her entire half-century reign trying to reach a workable settlement with Protestant dissenters that would permit them free worship without endangering her political authority toward a more perfect union, limiting English absolutism. Although absolutism became the norm in European governing, various legal instruments prevented it from depriving citizens of all rights. One of the most important of these instruments in England was the Magna Carta. Originally forced upon King John in 1215, it was renewed a number of times and finally entered into the official statute rolls in 1297, forming the key prop for the creation of an English constitution. Among other things, this document placed the king under the authority of an assembly of five and twenty barons of the kingdom who were empowered to hear petitions for redress of grievances against the king, entitling them to seize royal castles and lands and to harass the king in all possible ways until redress had been obtained. It also proclaimed that, quote, no freeman shall be taken, imprisoned, or in any way destroyed, nor will we proceed against or prosecute him except by the lawful judgment of his peers and by the law of the land. As Americans later sought to make a more perfect union, the principles of the Magna Carta loomed large in their designs. Individual Voices, Native Americans' View of the World, Powhatan's Mantle. Though we usually do not think of maps as voices, they do give voice to particular views of the world held by particular people in particular places, and they are designed for particular purposes. A case in point is a map referred to as Powhatan's Mantle. Though it may not have been an actual cloak worn by Wahoo Sunakok, experts agree that it is from that time and that place. This map depicts the alliance system constructed by Wahoo Sunakok during his lifetime, with him in the center and the various confederation villages as beaded discs surrounding him. Take a few minutes to check out the questions and the actual image there on the page to help you understand more why that artifact was sort of the bookends of this chapter. Summary. Making America began many thousands of years ago. Over millennia, the continent's residents continually crafted economic strategies, social arrangements, and political systems to preserve and enhance their lives. The result was a rich and flourishing world of different cultures, linked by common religious and economic bonds. At first, the arrival of Europeans only added another society to an already cosmopolitan atmosphere. Ultimately, though, the dynamic European society that arose after the onset of the Little Ice Age became more intrusive. As a result, Native Americans faced challenges that they had never imagined, economic crises, disease, war, and the unfolding environmental changes wrought by the Europeans who followed Columbus. In addition, influences from the New World reached out to accelerate processes that were already affecting the old. The flow of wealth and food out of the West was increasing populations, and this growth, with the accompanying rise of powerful kings and unified nations, led to continuing conflict over newfound resources. In Africa, strong coastal states raided weaker neighboring groups, more than doubling the flow of slaves out of Africa. This, in turn, influenced further developments in America. 
As disease destroyed millions of Indians, newcomers from the entire Atlantic Rim poured in to replace them. These newcomers came from a very different physical environment and had distinctly foreign ideas about nature. Their novel practices and ideas helped to create a new America on top of the old, rendering drastic changes to the landscape. Continuing interactions among these various newcomers and between them and the survivors of America's original people would launch the process of making America.